In part one of this series, we covered the junior half of a Codex compliant Space Marine chapter from the period of the 41st millennium. Now we shall advance our studies to their veteran battle brothers who make up the senior elements of the 5th through 1st companies. In doing so, we will gain a better appreciation for their true capabilities in war. From the ability of a single Marine to bolster the morale of a faltering colonial defence force, to the ability of a well-equipped strike force to eliminate threats across the galaxy, or to join with larger Imperial forces for full-on campaigns. This is the true size of the Ultramarine chapter in action. So I hope you guys are enjoying this content as much as I have been. Uh, it turns out the True Size series and 40K is just a match made in heaven. It's got an art production team, super excited. They're already working on some future episodes. So by detailing, you know, the inside of Space Marine vehicles, by doing some art for the Tyranids, Waz, thinking about doing Titans, it's all gonna be really, really fun. So we have 40K on the mind and I've got 40K in the pocket because I've been playing a lot of Warhammer 40K Tacticus, which is today's sponsor. Now I've actually been playing this game for quite a while I really enjoy it and I actually reached out to them. It turns out that the team at Snowprint Studios is actually a fan of ours, they're viewers, and so it was a really nice collaboration and they're willing to support us. Now as for the game itself, it stands out for two major reasons. One, it's fun. Two, it's fair. So let's get into these. For fun, it's because this is a really open, crunchy, tactical battle. Uh, the way it plays out is you essentially have a hex-based battlefield where you deploy your troops against a range of enemy forces. The battlefield is very dynamic. Line of sight matters, character movement matters, range of weapons matters, the type of terrain matters. It's all really important and it makes for really great replayability. In addition, they have really good level design. So for instance, one of my favorite ones I played recently is Chaos Charging at Imperials where the enemy has two major abilities, call on artillery, call on reinforcements. And it makes for a gameplay where you're basically under the gun charging, trying to clear out the Imperials before you get swamped by shells and men. So I think that's really fun. Zooming out the way this plays out is basically you start off with a small cadre of characters playing in one campaign. You slowly unlock different characters from different factions, which then allows you to play in different campaigns. And then you play those and you slowly expand to get a bigger and bigger roster of character, more and more campaigns. So that I found out played in a really fun gameplay loop that expanded and kept itself fresh. Now as to the second point why I like Tacticus is because it's fair. I felt that the pacing of all this was really natural and it wasn't asking me to pay to unlock these different tiers. I could progress at a rate that I felt was achievable without having to put any money down. Uh, in addition to that, it felt like most mobile games have you on a timer where you run out of energy before you can play your fill. That is not the case in this game you can easily pivot to one of your other campaigns, or you can go into the plethora of other battles that they have uh, available to you. You have guild battles, for instance, you have these scavenger battles, you have these wave-based onslaught battles, you have these weeklies and monthly special events, so there's always something to do. So if this sounds interesting to you, scan the QR code above, go in the description, click the link there, and once you're in the game, use the code INVICTA23 to get some really awesome goodies, uh, but act quickly because it expires on uh, January 7th, 2024. So enjoy, and I'll see you in the rest of the video. By the dictates of the Codex Astartes, a Space Marine chapter of the second founding is composed of 10 companies, each with roughly 10 squads of 10 Marines for a total of approximately 1,000 warriors. New recruits wishing to join their ranks must first pass through the 10th Scout Company, where they will be introduced to the basic arsenal and operations of the Space Marines. In the 9th, they master the art of the defense among the Devastator squads, and in the 8th, they master the art of offense among the Assault squads. These skills are then brought into balance among the tactical squads of the 7th and 6th companies. Only having proven themselves will a Marine stand a chance of advancing onto the ranks of the battle companies. Such units typically act as the chapter's primary frontline force, 
which will be actively deployed among the various war zones of the Imperium. As a result, the battle companies are organized with a mixed force of squads and vehicles to meet the needs of a given campaign, whilst calling upon the reserve companies for replacements or reinforcements as needed. For a better understanding of their role, let's now take a closer look at some examples from the Ultramarine chapter. Here is the assembled might of the Fifth Company, the Wardens of the Eastern Fringe, who are led by Captain Cato Galenus. Its makeup is typical of the battle companies, featuring six tactical squads, two devastator squads, and two assault squads. As their name implies, the Wardens of the Eastern Fringe are among the most far-travelling of their brethren, being deployed for years or decades away from Ultramar on various campaigns. It is on these missions that a Marine will learn to fight alongside a wide variety of Imperial forces and run the gauntlet of mankind's most bitter enemies. In addition to providing crucial training, these distant Crusades also serve an important strategic and propagandic role for the chapter. Strategically, the Fifth provides an important tool of force projection. Often referred to as the Gladius Strike Force template, their operations will see them break out into smaller groups to parry incoming attacks and deal quick, efficient blows capable of neutralizing foes many times their size. In terms of propaganda, the distant nature of these campaigns also serves to inspire the realms of the Imperium with a reminder that no planet is beyond the reach of the Emperor's angels. Even the presence of a single Marine may be enough to shore up the morale of an entire colonial defence force, as is evidenced by the following record of the Guardsmen. Quote, I have seen a thing today which I knew only from the storybooks of my childhood. Oh, so mighty, and so broad, and so bold, that it might have been a statue on the colonnade of the Emperor come to life. Its armour glowed like the moon, gunmetal bright, and it smelled of sweet oils and sacred lotions. In its fist, five times the size of my fist, it clenched a spear twice the length of my body. I think we will live if these gods are with us. In keeping with the strike force nature of the Fifth Company, it may bring with it a larger vehicle pool capable of extended deployment with supporting starships for transportation and orbital strikes. Next comes the Fourth Company, known to the Ultramarines as the Defenders of Ultramar. They are led by the recently promoted Captain Uriel Ventress and are composed of the same squad mix as the Fifth Company. But whereas their brethren may see active deployment at the far reaches of the galaxy, the Defenders of Ultramar remain embroiled on the front lines closer to home. While the Fourth has been known to protect its borders with glorious offensives, many of their forces take the defensive as commanders of auxiliar garrisons, as castellans of major fortifications, and as specialist operators of key military infrastructure. They do so against the endless waves of foes which threaten Macrag and its domains. From tyrannid swarms to orc warbands, heretic cults, and endless horrors from beyond. As such, the 4th Company Vehicle Pool makes excellent use of mass fire support and heavy armour to pulverise all those who approach their strongholds. Transports and gunships in turn allow these otherwise slow-moving assets to quickly relocate for a dynamic defence. Thus has the heartland of the Ultramarines been preserved for hundreds of years. But while the 5th and fourth companies may cover battlefields near and far, the third company focuses on a very specific part of the warfighting spectrum, as is evidenced by their name, the Scourge of the Xenos. Led by Captain Mikhail Fabian, whose hatred of aliens has reached notorious levels even by Imperial standards, their squads have gained a special reputation for combating the myriad Xenos threats which infest the galaxy. Much of this skill has been honed against the Tyranids dating back to their first brutal conflict 
with Hive Fleet Behemoth in the First Tyrannic War. As such, the Third Company has developed a great expertise in short-ranged firefights, which leverage flamer and melter weaponry in order to purge Xenos hives, fortifications, and space hulks. It should be no surprise, then, that many members of the Third have been recruited into the dedicated anti-Xenos chapter of the Death Watch. Those who return alive to the Ultramarines are honored with the rank of Tyrannic War Veteran. In terms of vehicles, the third will use a range of craft which have been further specialized to counter a particular alien race. Whether this means more firepower, more armor, or more mobility depends on the situation at hand. The last and most prestigious of the chapter's battle companies is the second company. Within the Ultramarines, these Guardians of the Temple are sworn defenders of the holy inner sanctum of their fortress monastery. Led by the legendary Captain Cato Sicarius, their squads have gained an impressive reputation for lightning strikes meant to win the battle before an enemy has even had the chance to respond. To the uninformed, their risky battlefield heroics may appear suicidal. But to the astute observer, they display a masterful exploitation of a space marine's transhuman physiology and advanced war gear to their fullest. Yet, in this pursuit of this perfection in combat and an unquestionable dedication to the Emperor, their bravado has, on multiple occasions, crossed the line into perceived recklessness and thus drawn censure from chapter command. The vehicles used by the second company match their preferred tactics, with an emphasis on mobility and hard-hitting firepower. In such matters, the Thunderhawk makes for an excellent armed transport ship, capable of dropping dozens of marines and heavy payloads such as tanks or dreadnoughts into the heat of the battle. Now finally, having spent many decades if not centuries honing their skills across countless battlefields and distinguishing themselves before their fellow battle brothers, it will be a Marine's ultimate honor to join the vaunted ranks of the First Company. Here, each man stands as a legend in his own right, with a service history easily mistaken for that of an entire unit. Among the Ultramarines, these are the Warriors of Ultramar, led by First Captain Severus Agamon. Their composition is made up entirely of veteran squads. Yet, unlike the rest of the chapter's squads, these troops are not limited to specific gear sets. Rather, they are granted access to the entirety of a chapter's armory, including advanced equipment and relic war gear. Each Marine thus customizes his loadout as he sees fit, resulting in an incredible flexibility of these veteran squads. Nonetheless, we may still group such troops into three broad types. The first of these are the Stern Guard Veteran Squads. Composed of nine Marines and a Sergeant, these are warriors who tend to favor ranged combat. As such, they are generally equipped with the portable bolt gun, whose performance has been significantly upgraded with superior optics and loaded with special issue ammunition such as the unstable Flux Core Vengeance Rounds, capable of penetrating the most heavily armored of targets. Stern Guard veterans also favor various mastercrafted combi weapons, which merge the best characteristics of more standard issue weapons. In contrast, Vanguard veterans are masters of close quarters combat, who often go into battle wearing jump packs. Their up to 10-man squads may use the bolt pistol and chainsword pairing, favored by their assault squad brethren. However, these veterans often leverage even more deadly power weapons, such as lightning claws, thunder hammers, and relic blades. For defense, many will also equip storm shields, capable of withstanding the most brutal of melee and ranged attacks, up to and including direct artillery hits. With such survivability and killing power, there is virtually no stopping such marines once they have reached your ranks. 
The third type of veteran squad is the Terminator Squad. Its up to 10 squad members are those who have been granted the honor of wearing tactical dreadnought armor, a right reserved for the men of the first company. Such marvels of imperial technology turn the wearer into a walking tank capable of effortlessly bringing to bear some of the heaviest weapons of the chapter's arsenal, including assault cannons, cyclone missile launchers, storm bolters, and heavy flamers. In close quarters, chain fists, lightning claws, and various other power weapons may also be used. The incredible durability of Terminator armor not only makes the wearer invulnerable to most incoming firepower, but also allows them to sustain the pressures of teleportation. Terminators can thus be equipped with personal teleporter packs to execute devastating pinpoint deep strikes. Altogether, this presents a condensed package of unimaginably deadly potential. The first company's vehicle pool is also fittingly unique. While all vessels are in theory available to the veteran company, they are granted near monopoly on the use of land raiders. These super-heavy infantry fighting vehicles are capable of transporting large squads of marines and terminators while unleashing torrents of firepower from its side-mounted twin-linked LAS cannons and hull-mounted twin-linked heavy bolters. Taken together, the might of the first company is a wonder to behold especially when fighting side by side with the rest of its chapter. Having thus covered the different companies and squad types of a Space Marine chapter, let us now finally turn to how its leadership is structured. Traditionally, a Codex-compliant chapter is led by a chapter master, chosen from the ranks of the company captains. He is protected by an elite honor guard and advised by a council of senior officers and confidants. The current Ultramarines chapter master is Marnius Kalgar, whose distinguished service has made him one of the most respected Astartes in the Imperium. Beneath the chapter master, High Command is further divided into four categories. The Apothecarian, the Librarius, the Reclusium, the chapter armory, and the Master of the Fleet, let us now examine each of these in order. The Apothecarian is chiefly responsible for preserving a chapter's vital stocks of gene seed, ensuring the creation of future space marines. The Apothecaries, meanwhile, also act as medical experts for the Astartes. The current Ultramarine's chief apothecary is Corpus Helix, a distinguished warrior and medicus known for his supreme patience and attention to detail. The Librarius upholds the chapter's repository of knowledge and is where its battle psychers, thus known as librarians, are trained. The Ultramarine's chief librarian is Varro Tigurius, who has gained high renown for both his impressive psychic abilities and deep wisdom. The Reclusium is the center of the chapter's cult and spiritual well-being whose chaplains serve as battle priests that inspire the men with words and actions. The High Chaplain of the Ultramarines is Ortan Cassius, who is famed for his efforts in combating the Tyranids and founding the Society of Tyrannic War Veterans. The Chapter Armory is responsible for the maintenance of a chapter's military equipment. It is here that heavy armor, war suits, and vehicles reside which will be diligently cared for by skilled tech marines who have been inducted into the cult Mechanicus. The current master of the forge of the Ultramarines is Phineas Maxim, known for his unceasing efforts in the Tyrannic Wars, and whose expertise in Astartes' weapons and technology has made his name synonymous with the Chapter Armory. And finally, there is the Master of the Fleet in charge of the chapter's space assets. This admiral will typically be one of the chapter's captains who has been selected by the chapter master to command the flagship and lead the fleet. Uriel Ventress holds this honor for the Ultramarines, bearing the title of Master of the Fleet. Last, but certainly not least, 
A chapter is supported by the unseen ranks of its mortal servants, who tend to the everyday needs of operating and maintaining a space marine force. These include the chapter's hereditary slaves, bonded serfs, servitors, astropaths, navigators, and more. However, ascertaining the number of such non-combatants is unfortunately quite difficult given their non-standardized nature. Roughly speaking, a typical Codex-compliant chapter like the Ultramarines may, on average, rely upon several thousand non-Astartes support personnel. If the crew of the chapter's fleet is included, the number can easily rise to the tens of thousands. Once we then account for the wider network of auxilia forces and other support personnel, our accounting must reach into the hundreds of thousands. But for now, this is where we shall end our review of a typical Codex-compliant Space Marine chapter of the 41st millennium. I hope you found this video both educational and entertaining. You can download all of our art, catch script previews, and participate in polls by joining our Patreon or YouTube membership. A huge thanks to our current members for supporting the channel and a big shout out to the researchers, writers and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related episodes. See you in the next one.